Hello and welcome back everybody. We are, find ourselves here in this arena challenge portal once more as we come back to Lords of the Fallen. And last time we were just leveling up our faith by quite the bit. And now it's time for us to change out our weaponry to suit. So we have been using Cleric and Persistence this whole time, but now we're going to be upgrading both of those to both Clawfinger and Kamar. Clawfinger is the scythe great axe combo that we got from killing Worshiper. <laughs> still still laugh at that name. And the Kamar is the very powerful staff that is incredibly useful for getting out a lot of damage in a short amount of time. I'll just show you how these two weapons work out. Kamar takes a lot of stamina, but it swings very quickly and does a ton of damage. Meanwhile, Clawfinger is just a great hulking great axe, allowing you to chop about with it, and when used one-handed, the heavy attack will sprout up that little magic pillar at the cost of a little bit of mana. That's because we managed to kill Clawfinger's minions with his stun, but before we leave this challenge area, we're gonna fight everybody one more time in order to get a little bit of extra experience since we're going to be needing that going forward. Let's see if we can get him right at the tip of his range. Here we go right now. Ah, oh, almost had it. Oh, that reminds me. Ah, oh, goodness. I am not taking this on effectively. Come on. Please? There we go. That's at least a backstab, but before I trigger the... You can see how much damage that does. It's very, very nice. It's almost enough to one-shot these guys outright with the weak attack, so the strong attack would definitely do that, but the important thing to do is also equip the Backbreaker Trinket, which increases our weight capacity by a ton, and because of that we can switch out to full symmetry armor and be ready for pretty much whatever the game's gonna throw at us. So let's shelter up to heal ourselves some as we start the next round. Gives it that nice blue tint. That's one of the cool things that I am really happy the game does, is it actually attaches a tint color to all of the magic types, meaning they feel very unique. And you can always pretty much tell what you're using. It's not a very big deal, but it is helpful. It keeps the theming down nicely, and it's just a nice touch to add to the aesthetic, so. We're swapping on our buckler for this last round because we've got that horrible, nasty old juggernaut coming out at us. And instead of dealing with him in a really cheesy way, we're going to use skill instead to properly parry him. Oh. I wanted to finish him off with a uh, magic spike, but apparently we don't have the damage for that just yet. There we go. Come on. He is just being annoying with that shield. There we go. You can always hit him when he's on the run-up, but unless you can kill him in one shot, that's just going to result in a trade that you'll probably lose, so you don't want to do that. But now that we've got that extra experience, we can head on out. Back to reality. We're going to leave our buckler equipped for these next two enemies because they can be parried out of their charging attack, which... Works quite nicely. Oh, he actually didn't manage to trigger the charge attack, so I couldn't parry him. But it's a short matter, and we can then proceed to knock this guy, <laughs> knock this guy down quite easily. You can see that the claw finger just does a lot of damage. Now we're gonna switch back out to our big stunking command shield and talk to Kazlo, because we're ready to head on in to the Good. next section of the game. You've made it this far. I was worried. But I guess the scythe just couldn't keep up with you. Yeah, I'm pretty great. Let's be honest. But they're, they're skill fighters. fighters. Well, well, well. Look what the cat dragon. Oh, Yetka. Lovely. Yes, Meet Yetka. Gang's all here. For whatever she's trying to find. How specific. You don't know the half of it, Harkin. I can see you've picked up a monk. The last one I met, I dumped. Charming. <laughs> you know how to break ice in conversation, don't you? Yes, yes. Well, uh, Yetka, what are you doing here? You've got business, I presume? Yes. You have business here. Miss this? 
Not a chance. There's a wealth of buried treasure over there. Ever the profiteer. To take my share. And Kazlo, we ready? Let's Kaslo, get this show on the road. Are you ready to open the pathway? As you might suspect, matters are a touch more complicated than I thought. That's good, but Too can you, you open don't the portal? Have the room combination to open it. Let me guess. You know what it is. I have the combination here in my book of lineage. We need to find someone that can wield magic. How but convenient. Because, uh, <laughs> allow me. We make the best team, everybody. And yes, we get to open up this little dimension here and travel through the pathway. I can't believe it. It's not a chamber. It's a whole other world. You're it's right. It is an entirely new place. Like a child's memory. It's twisted, broken. That ray of light. Is this the device you're looking for? Well, never mind. Off to get some treasure. Finders keepers. Well, it's nice to know you care so much, Yetka. But don't worry, we'll be having some more encounters with her in the future. She's actually a pretty important NPC and has a lot of plots involving her. But in the meanwhile, we need to make our way up here and meet with that lovely little creature over there. He is going to be quite the fun addition. Hideous. He took his leaden sword in hand. You can speak, as can you. Imagine my surprise. Well, he turned that around quite quickly. He's only named the crafter, but I just love his character because he's pretty much a direct reference to uh, Alice in Wonderland, as you can see by some of his dialogues. This is absurd. It does not matter much which way you go. He can often be found quoting the Cheshire Cat, and that's just what hilarious time? for me because I really do like I Alice know. in Wonderland. I do not abide the mortal laws. I left the realm of men a hundred lifetimes ago. I do not have a name. I don't remember it. And it does not matter here. You left the realm of men? From the moment the universes were born, they began to die. It's inevitable. Nothing stays the same. Even you are changing in this moment. Right in front of me. And I in front of you. As they say, no man ever steps into the same river twice. For it is no longer the same river, and he is no longer the same man. But, uh, enough of that. What What's he doing, doing here? here? Something is searching for me. Something of high value. It will arrive by and by. What do you mean? Well, you've got confidence. It will come when the Rogar go. The Rogar are not leaving any time soon. Coming and going. Going and coming. It makes no difference to me. What is this precious thing you seek? It is a crystal. A very special crystal. A crystal that can rend a tear between the realms. A tear powerful enough to distort other ruptures. The Rogar could be using that crystal to enter our world. You don't you say. Find the crystal itself in the place of power. A place where all energy can Take it away, and the Rogar Lords will travel no more. Then, bring it back to me. Yes. That sounds like a wonderful idea. I'd really like to interrupt all that warping in these Rogar Lords have been doing for the last little bit, but... What exactly are you? Some sort of smith? These tools... Are you a smithy of some sort? In some ways, yes. You could say so. I do have dealings with weapons and the like. Craft something for me. You ask me for a glass of water, and I could give you the ocean. Give me the ocean then. Show me one of your runes, and with this rune, you can imbue any weapon you like. There we go. Now he outright says it. This crafter allows you to uh, break down these runes into... the sealed runes into runes that you can actually use to equip to your weapons, like this fire rune will add three damage to fire weapons, increase shields, block, or just add some fire defense to your gear, but the reason we needed a little extra experience was because you can also pay a certain amount of experience in order to increase your chances of getting good runes, such as when you're breaking open these big runes, you can get higher or flawless runes, 
and when breaking open these smaller runes, you can get a variety of runes as well. Sadly enough, it seems we've just managed to get a bunch of fire runes, higher or otherwise, and we're not really going to bother with any of those because they're pretty useless. The only runes that I would say are of any value are power runes and luck runes, which are very, very useful for a variety of types of equipment, both for armor and weapons. So we're going to wait until we can get a few more bits of experience so we can get a proper set of runes. In the meanwhile, we can just take these guys down. Luckily, I had my shield on my back for that arrow that came out of nowhere, and that also in uh, gave an example for one of the really unique and uh, great mechanics in Lords of the Fallen, is that shields actually exist within the world. Like, just because they're on your back doesn't mean that you're no longer receiving a benefit. Even when a shield's on your back, you're still conveyed a small perk for having it there in so far as it can block attacks and it just naturally increases your defense. So that's one of the really interesting things that they did when making this game was they gave you an incentive to have a really big shield like this command shield because even if you're still going two-handed then it can stay on your back increasing your def your defenses as well as just being a great big boost to your utility when you actually decide to pull it out but that's just a little bit on design let's Swords pick this up are made for mortals but this sword it is something else if I only imbue these runes on it, this sword will be fit for gods. This little lost pike is one of the first uh, secrets of the game that's actually secretive in any way, shape, or form. Insofar as, as you can tell by its description, you kind of need a specific set of runes to get the most out of it. But they, ooh, they failed that. Let's see if we can get him with the second pillar. There we go. As you can tell by the description in that audio log, you need a specific set of runes to unlock its full potential. And the actual weapon itself gives you a bit of a hint if you look at it. Let's, where is Lost Pike? It has two secrets hidden in this weapon. A smaller one about poison and a greater one about fire. And what that means is that if you equip the right runes into it, it actually gains a base enchantment and starts splitting its damage between several different elements, both poison and fire, which is fairly decent, at least for this point in the game. It's also very useful in that it has two whole slots, so you can use it just for that or use it for the intended secret purpose, but I'm probably going to stick to the weapons I have now just because they're so powerful for this stage of the game. While it's true that I am intending to make this a very strength focused playthrough, because we just got our faith up so uh, just cannot make that jump properly. But because we got our faith up so high, right now both the Clawfinger and Kamar are going to be stronger weapons for this stage of the game. And it won't be until we get a little bit more strength and a few better strength weapons that we actually switch back over to using weapons that scale based on the strength stat rather than faith itself. The one bonus of that though is that we get to wield these very hefty nice weapons that can do a whole lot for us. The claw finger column attack is really great for keeping enemies stunned out and if we want to be attacking fast and in a sort of sweeping arc and uh, then the Kamar will do great things for us if he would stop backing away. So let's see if we can knock him out of the park. Beautiful. And if we come out just a little bit more... Uh, is it not behind this? Okay, it's got to be behind the next wall. There's a trapper waiting in ambush somewhere over here. There we are. These guys I call trappers. I don't believe that anywhere in the game they actually have their names stated, but they can actually throw down the little bear trap that you can see that are dangling all over its 
corpse and do pretty nasty things with a bunch of other thrown projectile type attacks. So I feel it's a really nice fitting name. To be entirely frank, there's actually not a whole lot of canonical names for these individual Rogar. So I've just taken to calling them individual things that kind of fit with who, what they are, what sort of weapons they wield, how they fight, etc. Like the Juggernauts. It's never stated that they're called Juggernauts, but because they do that very heavy ramming attack and hide behind their shield, I just find that to be the easiest thing to call them. That guy right there is a tyrant, and he has a very interesting little gimmick. So I'm going to run headlong into the gimmick this first time just to give you an idea. Ooh, dear. Just to give you an idea of what it is and how you're intended to find out about it. One of the problems that these guys have is that they have that sort of parry attack that is basically unblockable and it triggers when you attack them. So I've, I've still not figured out how to deal with that. But as you can see, you can't actually kill this guy until you take care of the tyrant heart that he has stashed nearby. And once you do that, you can't actually kill him, but not until. And that's a really interesting little gimmick that they take pretty heavy advantage of and is a part of how they design certain levels, both to introduce you to the tyrant early and hide his heart from you until you can kill him once. Because once you deal enough damage to get him down on the ground, he actually develops that little red healing tether that tells you exactly where to go to take care of his tyrant heart. But for now, we're just gonna go around this Rogar realm, killing all these nasty, nasty creatures here in the eternal flame, the sort of pit down here that the panorama surrounds and is acts as sort of a gallery towards. There's a few nice things down here that I just picked up, namely that bottle a key that's useful somewhere else, and I believe that there was also a rune sitting on the ground. There we go. That's how you want to take care of these guys. Once you can get a sprinting attack that kills them in one hit, they become much more trivial because you don't need to worry about running around for a backstab or pulling out a shield and a buckler rather and parrying at a very precise timing. You can instead just take the offensive and deal with them as you see them. But every time I get a backstab with this weapon, I just love to watch it because of how the scythe actually looks in the backstab animation. It just slides right into their shoulder and you know that they're done. Especially because great axes have a pretty high amount of damage based on criticals, so most anything that you do successfully backstab with this weapon, at least in this stage of the game, is going to die. You gotta come over here and deal with this trapper while he's just sitting over here tanking pot shots at me. That really massive tree, twig, beast-like creature over there is a chimera and has a variety of really annoying attacks. As you can see, its left-hand mouth can shoot out a spike to deal damage to you. And he has a jumping smash that deals a little bit of an AoE. And a bunch of delayed attacks that are designed to punish you if you move in too quickly. The space between dimensions tore apart. Threads of energy collide in space. Strong ones form links between dimensions. Most rifts are just unaccessible sources of energy, but others are tears. They become the pathways. Some appear like a whirlwind, like a storm that only a lunatic would enter. I have not traveled through a pathway myself, but some say that when you do, it changes you. This little doorway right here is locked from that side, so now we can traverse it either way. Behind here is the uh, second chamber that we went into, the one with the trapper and the three dogs. This guy has been here the whole time, but I didn't want to deal with him until I had picked up the key from the tyrant in order to come in here 
and loot this room, which has another ancient plate. You may have noticed I picked one up from down below. And also a nice set of armor and attribute point shard, which is a very, very worthwhile reward. The... Oh, let's, uh, let's go over this way first before I discuss that. But the ancient plates are an interesting little quest mechanic in that you can find a total of five of them and you turn them into Yetka for increasingly better rewards. So if you can find three, you get one of every regular shard. If you find another one, you get an attribute point shard. And if you find all five, then you get a spell point shard as well. So they give you a constant incentive to explore. Oh, I mucked that one up. Let's use an actual heal because I don't think I have time for a shelter. But if you find, they give you a clear incentive to find all of them and find them in a sort of order such that you can uh, go to her and turn in all five because uh, the next time we meet her is going to be the only time we really get to uh, turn those in until much further in the game. So it's really important that we kind of wait off on that. I would normally backstab here, but this enemy is uh, specifically scripted to run away when you first engage it, even if you manage to get a backstab. So you basically have to use a regular attack, otherwise your entire backstab animation is going to whiff and you'll just be left there just kind of waiting around to be done with that so you can finish him off. We grab another ancient plate which brings us to a total of three and we pay a pair of runes in order to break in here and steal this chest which holds two things, greed and an empty bottle. Greed's an interesting trinket in that it basically counts as a bit of extra luck points, granting you increased item discovery and a better chance at getting good runes when uh, crafting them with the crafter. But aside from that, I actually like to stick with Backbreaker for the most part because just that extra amount of weight is so helpful. Speaking of which... We have enough to actually upgrade our equipment, and we did get a lot of extra armor, so I'm going to switch some of that up. We still have way more weight than we could ever possibly use, so let's go with greed for now until we can pick up some heavier armor. And come on down, destroy this chimera as soon as he's ready for me. The best strategy for dealing with these guys is just to hold up your shield and sort of do a little dance outside of their reach. And when they come in for the jump, set up with a strong attack and then tear them down with the rest of your combo. But that's going to be where we cut this episode. We've got a nice little checkpoint waiting for us here that we're going to take advantage of. And I will see you all in the next episode as we head further into the Rogar realm and hopefully do a lot more in this whole place. So keep an eye out for that and I will see you all next time. Have a great day.